Hello, welcome once again to Fridays with Father. Over the next few weeks, as we go into the last week of Lent, Holy Week, and then Easter, I'm going to be focusing on a number of different passages that we read at Mass uh, for these holy days. So today I'm going to begin with one part and, uh, you know, continue as time goes on. So kind of stick with me. I hope uh, you'll make the journey with me. So the first passage I want to talk about is Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. We commemorate this day on Palm Sunday when we wave palms in church. Uh, everybody comes and it I'm always amazed by the way that people can uh, weave their palms. They make beautiful crosses. Uh, I, I've joked around that I saw a guy actually uh, weave a new roof for his house with all of the different palms mm. that they were taking home. But the palms really kind of um, capture our imagination. It's a time for us to welcome, to wave the palms and welcome Jesus into our lives. However, there is, of course, a downside, a sad side to this, because as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, uh, he is being hailed as a hero. People are throwing their cloaks onto the road, and Jesus sits on a burrow, a donkey, as he rides into uh, Jerusalem, and people wave palms and sing Hosanna. And everybody, of course, thinks, this is it. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, and he's going to take the throne of David, his ancestor. He's going to be the great king, and he is going to right every wrong that has been done to the Israelite people. Well, of course, we know well that it doesn't exactly go that way, because the cries of Hosanna on Palm Sunday will, on Good Friday, turn to cries of, crucify him, crucify him. So Jesus comes in on a donkey. Uh, so he rides in. Now most kings, most people of importance at that time, how do they enter in? They come in with a horse, or maybe even more than one horse, on a chariot. That is the sign of power. That is the sign of influence. Jesus comes in riding on a simple donkey. And still, nonetheless, people um, greet him regally. So does he come in as an earthly king? No, he doesn't. He doesn't come in that way. But he does come in as someone of importance, but also, too, of humility. He's on a donkey and not on a horse that a rich person or an influential politician would have at the time. Also, too, is Jesus tells his disciples to go into the city and prepare a place. And so he sends them out. And... It, you realize that Jesus is not on his own. There are a lot of people who are watching out for him. There are people who are going to, uh, to set up a place for him to eat the Passover with his disciples. He has a lot of people surrounding him on this particular day as he enters into Jerusalem. But very soon, all of those people will disperse and they will no longer be with him. So it's kind of a bittersweet day. On the one hand, a great deal of joy and anticipation. The, uh, the image I think of, forgive me for this, but the image I think of is uh, a number of years ago, Tiger Woods was walking down the 18th fairway at the Western Open, and he was basically about to win the tournament. And a ton of people, just a flood of people are behind him, jumping and yelling and screaming and smiling in the background. And I think that's probably kind of the same way Jesus enters into Jerusalem. But he doesn't come in to win in an earthly way as Tiger would have. Jesus comes in to die, but also to rise to new life. And so this entrance into Jerusalem is important for us because it, um, it makes us think about how sometimes we're on top of the world, just like Jesus is on this particular day. Coming into Jerusalem, everything's all right. People are behind him. But then also, too, like a roller coaster, uh, he will be very, very down on Holy Thursday and Good Friday. But still, there is always that hope of resurrection to new life. And so... He recalls that all of the prophets who came to Jerusalem ultimately were rejected there. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. 
All of them came to Jerusalem. That is the city of the prophets. And all of them met a similar end. And so Jesus will mark the end of all of the prophets that went before him. Why? Because he is God's final word. Certainly Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, all of them shared the word of God. They would go to someone, go to the king usually and say, thus says the Lord, and give their prophecy. But Jesus is the word of the Lord. He comes to, to show the world, this is God among you. This is God living among you. Don't reject him, accept him. However, what happens? He gets rejected on Good Friday and is killed just like all of the prophets before him. But none of the other prophets rose again. None of the other prophets were able to say, I'm not going to worry because in a few days I'll rise again. No, only Jesus is able to say that. And of course, Jesus, through that death and resurrection, changes the world forever. So also, too, as I mentioned before, Jesus tells his disciples to go into the city and to prepare a place for the Passover, for the Last Supper. So Jesus comes as the person who sacrifices. He is at the table with his disciples. But he also, in himself, is the sacrificial lamb. Remember, please, at the Passover, a lamb was sacrificed, just as a lamb was sacrificed uh, during the time of Moses. And the blood of the lamb was placed on the lintel, the doorposts of the house. And that marked the houses where the Jewish people were, and thus they were saved, and they were passed over. Well, Jesus now is the new Passover sacrifice. He is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. So he will be sacrificed. So on this final night, he gathers together with his disciples to offer the Passover and also to be the Passover lamb. So his blood, shedding his blood, he will free his people Israel and indeed all people from the stain of sin and will be able to be with them to protect them for always. And so the blood of the old covenant was poured out on the altar. Now it also is done once again. Jesus puts that blood, that wine that he presents to his disciples, puts it on the table and says, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant is done. Now there is a new covenant. And in that wine, in this blood that I shed, you will have new favor, new blessing, a new time of life for yourself in the Lord Jesus. And so this is not an animal sacrifice. This is Jesus coming into the world to offer himself as a sacrifice for all of humanity. So at the Last Supper, what does Jesus do? He has bread in one plate and he has wine in a cup. Now for us, think about it. If you have body over here and blood over here, what happens? Not a good thing. <laughs> you essentially will die if your blood is over here and your body is over here. So Jesus offers them separately, his body, his blood. But then what happens? He gives that body and that blood to his disciples and he gives it to us at Sunday Mass. And what happens? That body and blood come together in us. And then our body, our blood, becomes blessed by the Lord Jesus. And so then we are called to offer Jesus once again as we minister to our family, to our friends, to the people at school, to the people at work, when we're driving, all of those different ways we are bringing the body and blood of Christ in our body and blood because we're ministering with our hands. We're going to someone's house to visit them. We're uh, visiting someone who's sick or in, in a hospital. Um, when we reach out, when we use our bodies to reach out to other people in love and care, we are imitating the example of the Lord Jesus, who at the Last Supper gives his body, his blood, for the life of the world. And so we do participate in the Eucharist in that way, not just receiving the body and blood of Christ, but being the body of, and blood of Christ for other people. 
Jesus tells his disciples, do this in memory of me. So what does that mean? Do we do it just once? Do we do it twice? Archbishop uh, Fulton Sheen of New York said many years ago, think about when you play with a child and you're playing tag or, uh, or you're playing it or something like that. And what happens? Does that child want to do that thing that's fun only once? No, wants to do it over and over again. And the adults wonder, oh my gosh, there's so much energy in this kid. How in the world can we slow him down? There's just too much. He wants to do it over and over and over again. And so Archbishop Sheen was saying that a child that wants to do a, a good thing, a joyous thing over and over again, that should be our attitude as well. So when we come to Eucharist, we don't come just once for First Communion and then be done with it. We don't come just twice. We don't come just at Christmas and Easter, but we come as often as we can on Sundays to honor the Lord Jesus and also be refreshed in our own lives spiritually so that we can continue to be body and blood for those who are around us. A very important thing because the, the, um, the Last Supper is presented over and over again when we come to Sunday Mass and we receive the body and blood of Jesus who strengthens us and energizes us to be his disciples. And so bread and wine also are important, um, important symbols at uh, the Last Supper and also at Mass. Bread, how do we make bread? We take wheat and we crush it. And by crushing that wheat, we're able to, uh, to make bread. How do we make wine? We take the grape and we crush it. And by crushing it, it becomes something new and different. Well, Jesus is the same thing. He is crushed for us. It says he is crushed for our sins. And just like bread and wine, or excuse me, uh, grains of wheat and grapes are crushed to make something new and different, so also too Jesus is crushed and then he is formed into bread and wine. Uh, once again, to sustain us on our journey to the kingdom. Remember also, too, is that at the Last Supper, and I think this is very important to remember, so many people tell me that they feel unworthy, that they really can't go to communion yet, they haven't confessed. There's any number of excuses that people offer. Think about it, though. Jesus looks around the table, and who does he see? He sees the disciples that he knows will abandon him tomorrow. They know that when he is arrested and taken into custody and taken to Pilate and then Herod, his disciples will scatter. They will leave. But what does he do? Does he say, eh, you guys just aren't worthy of this. Forget about it. You can't receive this body and blood. You're not perfect yet. You're not saints yet. Does he say that? Absolutely not. He dips the morsel and gives it to Peter, who will deny him three times. Gives it to the disciples who will run away from him. And read the Gospels. It's in there. Jesus gives, <clears throat> excuse me, gives a morsel of bread even to Judas. Judas, the one who will turn him over, the one who will basically sell him into crucifixion for 30 pieces of silver. Judas receives also the bread. And so Jesus probably is saying to him, I'm thinking, Judas, there's still a chance for you. There's always a chance for you. Even though you've put this great plan into motion, stop it and things can be different. Now, I'm paraphrasing, I'll admit. But at the same time, Jesus gives him that morsel of bread. And I think that's really important. If Jesus can give communion to Judas and all of his disciples who abandoned him, how do we say that we're unworthy then? Because, as Jesus says in another part of the gospel, it is the sick who need a doctor. And so a doctor who is Jesus, who can heal us, also comes to us in communion and offers us himself, even though we may not be worthy of it. And so Jesus gives to them at the Last Supper generously and freely, doesn't ask them if they're perfect, doesn't ask them if, they, if they've got this whole 
um, Jesus and uh, redemption thing down if they know it 100%. Uh, no, doesn't ask those questions. Just gives to them. Jesus always does. He is always generous with his people. Now, part of the Last Supper in John's Gospel is what we call the washing of the feet. There is no sharing of bread and wine in John's Gospel. There is only the washing the feet, which is interesting. So the disciples are gathered with Jesus and they think they're going to have the Passover meal. But then remember that Jesus then takes off his outer garments and starts to wash their feet, which is very strange because washing people's feet really was a servant's task, a slave's task. Nobody like Jesus, who is the Son of God, should really be doing this, but he does it anyway. He washes their feet. Once again, even Judas's feet, he's in there, uh, washes Judas's feet. And so Jesus shows his love, his devotion, his care for his disciples by doing a servant's task. He is a servant above and beyond everything. There's been uh, washing before. Remember, uh, Jesus' feet is washed uh, by a woman's tears, and then his feet are anointed against the day of burial, it says. And so there is a precedent for this. So Jesus' feet were washed and anointed. Now he is going to wash the feet of his disciples as a final sign of service to them and an example to them of what they are called to do in the world. That is to take away the, um, the trappings of their office, to not worry so much about being served, but always to serve other people. So Jesus reaches out to his disciples, washes their feet. Think about it in our own time. Would a king in our own time wash his, uh, his um, subjects' feet? Would the mayor of our village do that? Nothing personal mayor, I'm just making, a, uh, <laughs> making an example. Would an alderman or an alderwoman do this? Would a senator or a congressman or a congresswoman do this? No, certainly not. It's a sign of humility, a sign of a lack of power, and Jesus certainly is entering into the most difficult time of his life where he really has no power or influence. However, even though he has no power or influence, he is able to rise above. He will rise again. Now, he comes to Peter, and Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. No way in the world. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you will have no inheritance with me. At which point Peter responds, then wash me from the top of my head down to the bottom of my feet. And so he's saying, you know, I want to, I want in, um, I want to participate in your life, Lord, from the top to the bottom. I want to be there for everything. Now, Peter is going to fail in the next couple of days. He's going to deny Jesus three times, but that's the effect of sin. Still, nonetheless, he wants to be part of Jesus' life from head to feet. We resolve that same thing. And even though we may not be perfect at it, even though at times we may fall, even though at times we may do things that we shouldn't be doing or not do the things that we ought to, ought to do, still, nonetheless, we ask Lord Jesus to give us his blessing because we're in this with him from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Lord Jesus, wash us clean so we can be part of your life. I think of this also in terms of an act of devotion. Um, I don't have any children myself, but I see moms do this all the time. Uh, their kids are out uh, and they've just had lunch and a, a, a kid has ketchup and peanut butter and jelly all over their faces and their hands. They probably have more of the food on them than in them. But what does mom do? Very lovingly, very, with a great deal of care, she takes a wet wipe or something like that and immediately cleans, starts cleaning the hands, starts cleaning the face to say, you know what, I love, and I'm, I love you and I'm caring for you and even though you can't eat the way I would like you to eat, still I'm ministering to you and I love you very, very deeply. And so I think that's just a, a few words that I wanted to say today 
like I said, over the next few weeks, I'll look at other passages. And uh, I believe the, the next one we have is the 21st of March. Um, so um, we'll cover a few other things then. So once again, what do we look for uh, as we're coming toward uh, Palm Sunday? We're remembering that Jesus is the Lamb of God who will be sacrificed for us. The one who gives his body and blood to us to nourish us and to cleanse us and to give us new life and new hope. And it's not just a uh, giving of his body and blood, it's also washing us clean as he did uh, wash the disciples' feet. He will wash us clean. And we pray today and for always that this Lenten season may deepen our lives, it may deepen our faith so that we can always be the disciples that Jesus calls us to be.